And that was an abrupt ending, but here we are. Uh, good evening, everyone. As folks are kind of tuning in and getting situated and that sort of thing, this is uh, this is, have, we've not I've not done something like this before, like midweek. But this topic has come up where um, to be really open. I had a teacher. I told her I would not say her name or where she teaches, but someone reached out the other day through a DM, and they said, look, I lost, they lost a student to gun violence on, uh, in one week. Later on that week, lost another student to uh, a car accident, fatal car accident. And then another student went missing that week. And so as we did a phone call, I just thought this is something that, and, and that individual said that she felt like uh, her school just didn't do it. They actually didn't, in her words, they didn't really do anything. And as someone that has lived through that multiple times, right, like last year lost six students and former students to gun violence, a number of other students shot uh, that did that, thankfully, lived. This is just something that is not talked about enough of how we as educators uh, or parents can walk into the school the next day or in that same day be in school and navigate these these incredibly difficult waters of dealing with trauma, dealing with trauma, especially with gun violence. And especially in this time where it feels like every day, every week, there's something happening in the world. So tonight I am joined by the incredibly wonderful Dr. Keisha, who is a friend of mine. We are in a program together. We met uh, and that I feel really like kindred spirits. So we're, the, our hope tonight is to just, we're going to have, a yeah. heavy, deep, and real conversation. But yeah. before we do that, I was telling you before we started that I don't know where to start with your bio. It is too extensive. So would you mind um, introducing yourself to everyone and kind of telling them who you are? No problem. So it is my honor to be here. My name is Dr. Keisha Serbois. I am a global education consultant, a faith-based mindset coach, and a TEDx, multiple TEDx speaker. Um, one of the things that I am most proud of is that I approach education from a global perspective, having done my master's degree in Beijing, China, and my doctorate in uh, Hong Kong. I hold the title of being the first African-American to get my degrees, my graduate degrees from that space. So I know a little bit about dealing with difficult things, particularly because as I was, you know, walking out that path. I was there 2014 to 20, the end of 2018. So that means I saw Alton, Ster Alton Sterling. I saw Philando Castile. I had to deal with the heartache of Trayvon Martin and all of these things. And so when we talk about gun violence and the things that really put me on this path, I have a unique agitation when it comes to the way in which gun violence is handled because the whole time I was getting my doctorate, you know, that's when the Black Lives Matter movement was starting and you were seeing, that's when we really saw the phenomenon of people being killed by police and it becoming viral on social media and us really having that access. That's like when that first wave really was gaining momentum and we had that horrific weekend where three black men were just killed one day after the other. Yep. And I was in uh, Hong Kong when that was happening. And so I was in a space where online, I was in this world of feeling attacked 
as a person of color. And then the moment I got off my phone, I would go outside and everybody was acting as though nothing had happened. And so when we talk about gun violence now, it's those firsthand experiences that push me forward as a researcher, that push me forward as someone who really relies on faith because I just know, uh, I know no other way to really deal with things that are this heavy, this difficult to comprehend, comprehend without a faith-based mindset. And then coming in with the neuroscience of how do we process this in the body? So that's my introduction. That's me. No, that's, so like when you talk about that, I mean, it is, it's something that I feel like folks have either, they've either lived through or, or it's like, let me say this. Before I taught, you would hear things that happened in schools, right? So like I remember when Columbine happened and I remember when subsequent other like school shootings happened. Mm -hmm. And it didn't hit me the same as when one, I had my own kids in school and two, I was a teacher. And so as an educator, I mean, we've lived through it. When I, where I taught in West Philadelphia, I mean, one day someone was shot outside of our window. Like my Mm -hmm. students and I saw, we, we heard the shot but mm-hmm. West Philly is so loud that you, you're not always sure like what you heard. Sometimes it sounds like a gunshot. Sometimes it was like, who knows, mm-hmm. but there's, we saw this young man um, bleed out in the street mm-hmm. in front of, in front of us. I had to yell out the window to two of my friends that didn't know where it had happened. And I was trying to yell at them to try and tell them to come back to the building. There have been shootings outside of our school where all of a sudden you're standing in hallway duty and you know, 30 people, literally 30 people run through the doors of the school. And you're like, what is happening? Like, they, like my first initial thought, this is how this, this is how random it was, was, is it raining or something? Like what happened? Mm-hmm. And then you find out that there was a shooting a half a block down and that all the kids that were walking to school to other schools just are running into the building. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, either being in class or returning to class after, there's there's been something horrific that has happened and and so for folks that have not dealt with gun violence in and or around your community Mm. i think that this is a good conversation too for for people that when there's a shooting at another school and your students hear about that and then they come to school and you it's do you have the conversation do you talk about these things do you when a kid says what if that happens at our school what are we going to do or If it's just that you have dealt with a different sort of trauma that has deeply and heavily impacted your school, I think this is a good conversation for any, anyone even in and around kind of that, that space. So I'm curious, you know, from your end, how, how did, how did you, what was that process like for you when you were, you know, um, being a person of color, all of this stuff is happening on the news, uh, like, how do you enter into the moment? How do you enter into the next day? Like, what, what yeah. does that look like for you? Yeah, that is really what propelled my interest in really getting grounded in a trauma-informed approach to learn how do I process this in the body? As a researcher, someone who has studied, you know, my area is education. My area is really figuring out how do we have difficult conversations with children using reading aloud? How do we strengthen uh, this from a two generational approach and really delving into that? But when COVID happened and people were isolated and people had um, interesting tensions with their school districts, there's a lot of feeling of we're not being looked after. We're being you know, forced to go into schools that don't seem to care about us. They're just telling us to teach there needed to be a space where we started to think about how do we repair those relationships? And as I was doing that work, I kept seeing how past trauma, past pain, because COVID, I call COVID the great equalizer. Mm. Whether you were familiar with trauma or not, anybody that walked through 2019 to 2020 to 2021 has some experience with trauma now. And then when you add what we saw with the social justice movements, when you add what we saw with death, that began to really cement my focus on, I have to help people process this 
in the body. But then in 2021, we saw the resurgence of mass shootings. And whether you have, like you mentioned so beautifully, firsthand experience where you have lived experiences of seeing students rushing through doors, of hearing the transition of someone's life, that sound. When you tell those stories, I'm, I'm almost positive glimpses or memories of that come up in your body, definitely show up in your mind. Mm. But anyone who is watching the news, Uvalde, Buffalo, grocery stores, school shootings, all of these things. Most recently, now, if you're on a bus coming back from a play in Washington, D.C., that your university has sponsored, you're now in a space where you could be uh, the victim of gun violence on a bus. And then the person who did the shooting somehow gets away. And when we talk about the gun violence training, one of the first things I did was look into this. And I was disturbed when I saw that the, as great as the advice is, it really comes down to run, hide, fight. What is problematic for me in that language and the tension I feel in my body as I see, as I say that is once the supposed threat passes, what do I do with the emotional fallout of having to think that I have to fight, of running from an active shooter situation, like that active shooter training, I understand we're in a, a steadily evolving situation, but what I realize is while we're doing the best that we can to help people get out of active shooter situations, we also have to spend just as much time understanding that the trauma does not end with the experience. In fact, the research says most trauma really doesn't show up around this type of stuff, three to six months later, which is why people can seemingly be okay. And then something like what we've seen in November, this has been a very difficult, very difficult November for people of color, particularly those in the black community, because November 1st started with hearing about the death of uh, Takeoff, a rapper from Migos. Then you had the, while you're processing that, the day after his funeral, we hear about the death of three African-American men, football players for the University of Virginia. And then while you're processing that, we're now dealing with the death of Shanquilla Robinson, who died in Mexico, but her family had to fight for justice. And so if you have experienced gun violence, if you have experienced situations where you thought you could trust people and they hurt you, if you have been on a bus doing a university trip, if you have someone who's still in university, all of these things can start to be triggers for you. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I'm happy that we're going to do tonight, not only are we going to take questions, but we're going to give people tools on things they can do in the moment. But the main thing I understand people need to learn how to do is be comfortable sitting in grief, be comfortable sitting in difficult situations. I see this all the time in my mindset coaching. We're so used to just processing things and moving through them quickly that we rarely allow ourselves to sit with difficult feelings and be okay not having the answer, realizing that that is modeling dynamic self-care to say, I don't know what to do. I am feeling this. And I'm going to allow this process through my body instead of suppressing it, because we all know what that does. And, and you know, when you say that, I think that there's a couple of things like as a as a high school teacher that has seen this happen firsthand. That one, the the trauma didn't always have to happen to you for you to have to deal with it, right? There, like it wasn't until only a few years ago I I ever heard of a a term secondary trauma. Yeah, and so that when we are working with folks that like, so when I'm working with young people that have been through trauma, that gets on you and that is hard to deal with. And so as a matter of fact, you know, I had to have a big conversation with, with uh, Pastor Darius at one point 
because when I was writing my book, I mentioned um, a few students that had gotten that, that had gotten shot. And as a way to sort of like help folks understand like where we're coming from and some of the things that my students were dealing with mm-hmm. that we had to figure out as a community to navigate. And that's probably something we're going to talk about later, that communal piece. But the, the there was a sensitivity editor that read my book before it came out. And she said, you have to you have to go back and read how you even talked about this because it was very cold. She's like, it almost read like a police report where, and, and she said, and I, I was like, Oh, like that was not my intention at all, Mm -hmm. but it was this conversation around like how we start to become desensitized to some of these things when they start happening so much. So when Columbine Mm -hmm. happened, it was a big deal. And Mm -hmm. even when, and I'm going to forget now because I have to remember it, the name of the school in Florida that there was a shooting at um, several years ago. At that same time, I had a kid mm. whose entire mm. family was murdered. Uh, mm. He was an 18-year-old senior, uh, mm-hmm. Saeed, and Saeed's whole family was murdered. And one of my boys, they did a walkout. There was a, glo- uh, a walkout all over the U.S. where mm. at a certain time, everyone walked out. They kind of like walked to the football field or around the block or whatever. And I remember standing outside with my students and a young man comes up to me and he goes, let me ask you something, Reynolds. He said, not out of any disrespect, but why are we walking out for kids that this happened to in Florida, but we're not even doing anything for someone that happened in our own neighborhood. Like, like both of those deaths should be honored and we're not. And to a large degree, I think it's because we either one, don't know what to do about it or two, it is you become you be, start to become desensitized to so many things happening. And what do you do with that? So even, you know, to go off of that for one more second, it is, I remember uh, the first time I lost a student and it was student got shot and uh, ended up in the hospital. He thought he was going to be all right. He was not and ended up passing away several days later. And my principal at the time came to me and he said, I got to ask you do you go home and tell your kids about this stuff? And because his kids were the same age as my kids. And I was like, you know what? I wasn't going to, because they were real. I mean, my children were very young at that time. They were probably like six and seven years old. And uh, it was like, it got to the point where I said I I had to, because they needed to know why dad was so sad. They needed to know why dad went to bed at six o'clock last night. Mm-hmm. And so I don't have to get graphic. I don't have to be, tell them all the details, but I did have to have that, that conversation. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, what do you tell educators? I want to, I, 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 like, yeah. or, or, or anyone, something yeah. happens. What's that first step? What is that pain plan? What does that look like? Um, exactly. What would that look like for folks? Exactly. And that's where we're going. Let's start to give the people on the call or the people who are watching tools to move forward because we are in no way disregarding the fact that we're talking about very heavy things. I also want to normalize the fact that we're talking about pain that people experience in their own unique way. There is no one way to go through the experience of losing a student or being a victim of gun violence or having fear and anxiety that you could be a future victim, or how you process this if this happened to you. There is no wrong or right way. There is no simplistic answer to do this. But there are things that you can do that can help prepare you for this. And like we were talking about before we started, one of the things I love about Dr. Darius Daniels is that he's always clear on giving us practical tips. And I looked at one of his uh, talks around having a pain plan when he was just talking about emotional grief and what do we do when um, relationships hurt us. But then I start looking at the research and I'm like, what would it look like if I adapted this and created a pain plan for educators and parents who are dealing with gun violence trauma? And so not only am I going to give you the five steps, but I'm also going to put a link uh, I'll put a link in our chat and then CJ, you could get it. I'll, I'll share it in the description so oh, everyone is sure to get it. Resources, right? But the first thing in terms of what do we do? What I want you to do is not wait until that moment happens. I want you to do these things right now because pain, trauma, grief, loss of this magnitude is disorienting. 
it is very difficult to think clearly in the midst of pain. Mm. It is much better to start planning how you're going to approach this from this type of perspective. When you have a little bit of distance. And so the first thing I would ask you to do is think about what will I say? What will I say to my students? What will I say to my home life? If you have children, what will I say to my children? If you're in a relationship, what will I say to my spouse? If you're single and you know that there are people that you can confide in, what will I say to them about what I experienced? The main thing is start to think about the language you want to use. Because only you know what your past experience has been. The reason why I can't give you a script of what that looks like, because everybody who's watching me is hearing me based off of your lived experiences. Unfortunately, some of you have experiences similar to CJ. Some of you understand what it is to be in situations where you have either been the target of gun violence or someone you love has been lost to gun violence. So when I say, think about what you will say, I want you to think about language that lets someone know this happened and it's triggering past memories of what this happened. And right now I'm spiraling or I'm in the midst of it. What is language you can say to help somebody you know, you love, you trust, understand where you are so they can be there to support you. It's much easier to think about this now, like I said, than when you're in the midst of it, because that is the equivalent of being in a very thick fog. All your body is trying to do is survive it because your nervous system has kicked in. Your higher cognitive thinking cannot participate in this conversation. Yeah. Right. So it's, that's it's like having. I, just real quick, I think it's it's similar to having like a first aid kit on hand, right? Absolutely. When, when something goes down, you don't want to figure out like where wait where do we put the band aids and the bandages and this stuff. Like, it's having that in place so that when it happens, you're ready, um, or or your will, right? It's it's certain things that you want to make sure that you understand. So I I love this idea. So, um, what what would be your? I'm 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 curious. What what is your next? Yeah, we're uh, going to keep going. So keep the first thing I said was, what will I say to others? But I also want you to think about, what will I say to myself? And this is just the research. Um, I need you to have what Carol Duet calls a growth mindset. I need you to write down some statements that you can tell yourself in the moment that encourage you to get through this. And it's not so much from the standpoint of I'm doing this for others. I got to be strong for others. I'm not at all saying that. I want you to use language that says I can get through this. This is hurting me, but I can get through this. I don't understand why this is happening, but this, there is an opportunity for growth in this. And I have the patience to experience this. And the reason why I use language, what if you don't what if you don't believe you can get through it? Is that still something? Is there power in saying something? Yes, yes. You it or, if you or, don't believe it, it's even more important that you're saying it to yourself in the moment. And while you're saying it, this is when you need to start to do breath work. Because while you're saying this, and I and, and understand the difference, I'm not telling you to say these things just because they're affirmations. I'm telling you this because your nervous system needs to minimize the threat and positive language is how you get your nervous system to believe that the body is safe. Mm -hmm. I can get through this. We're safe. We can do this because as long as your body is in a fight, flight, freeze response, higher cognitive thinking does not come into this. And the thing about gun violence is, unlike the way our bodies were designed, we were not meant to be under constant stress. Gun violence has shifted everything about our bodies because we never know when the next thing is supposed to happen. Our nervous system is supposed to kick into gear when we need to either run from a predator or hunt for a predator. Then we're supposed to go back to normal. But this space where anything could happen at any time, if you do not find language that teaches you 
how to process this, even if you don't believe it. Mm. Do it for the sake of your body. Because if you stay under this high state of anxiety, it will have much deeper repercussions on your body. Wow. Wow. That's really, that, I think that's so important because I, I, I think there are moments when you are, it can take you down to such a level yes. where, you know, when there was a year when we had lost so many young men that it was like one of my boys came in and he was like, how do we even keep going with this stuff? Right. Cause then like you have to go back to teaching. And, mm -hmm. and, and so it's when you have that feeling of, I can't get through this. I can't do this. Yeah. I can't go anymore. Yeah. It is, it's to know that, that I love that idea of like your, your higher cognitive self cannot, we're not even there right now. So what we need yeah. to do is it's like yeah. your body's going to believe this. So I'm mm -hmm. saying it because my my mind will believe it and help me to come down so then I can actually deal with, with what's next. So yeah. We're just going to keep flowing in this direction. Um, I, I, I want to talk because when you said that, I, I really sense that that is a very real concern because when we're talking about educators who have had this happen repeatedly, how do I convince myself that this is even possible? I want to pull up. Um, can you show the slide? CLCBE. This is something um, that was created through the genius of Dr. Howard C. Stevenson. And I am honored to be one of their racial literacy trainers. But this is something we use when we're consistently, oh, and the organization is called Lion Story. I definitely want to give credit where credit is due. This is Dr. Stevenson's work, and this is their model on how we process racial stress within the body. But you can adapt this to any situation, particularly good for gun violence, trauma, and the type of things we're talking about. So let's use this experience, CJ, if I may walk this through with you. Let's yeah. go to that experience of that low place that you just mentioned. If you had to put a name to the feelings that you saw or you felt in your body in that low place, what would you name them? Oh my gosh. Uh, concern, immediate concern, right? So like when the shooting happened, the one of that shooting where we, the young man was shot outside of my classroom window, a feeling of concern for my students, mm -hmm. a feeling of incredible anxiety as to, does anyone else know that this happened? Are we locked down? Are, are people going to be safe? Mm -hmm. um, immediate worry of like how to, because students all respond differently, right? Some kids are at the window. Some kids mm -hmm. are hiding under a desk. Some kids mm -hmm. are seem almost aloof and want to go, can I go to the bathroom, Mr. Reynolds? So there are all these different ways. Some kids are crying and I'll tell you, um, like in the aftermath. And, and, and so you see this a lot in our school where like kids will, if for showing emotion, for being worried, for being scared, for going to therapy, we're mm -hmm. actually like really like trash talked by their friends for, mm -hmm. for, for showing that sort of emotion. And so it is trying to look out for all these different kids that are presenting in all these different ways also. And that feeling incredibly overwhelming, like mm -hmm. you had to show up but could you show up? So that that's where, that's where my head goes first. That's good. So I've heard you voice concern, anxiety, worry, and overwhelm. Yes, ma'am. Now, we're, the first thing we did for those who, I'm teaching you the skill of CLCBE in real time because this is a real conversation and we're using a real lived experience. So that feeling of concern, as you were telling that story, if you had to give that a number of one to 10, where it calculate, one being barely noticeable, 10 being this intense, very, very strong feeling, the strongest you can feel it is out of 10. What number would you give concern on a scale of one to 10? 10, absolutely. What number would you give anxiety on a scale of one to 10? A 10. What number would you give worry? A 10. And what number would you give overwhelmed? 10. Now, anytime the number is higher than five, 
We need to pay close attention to it because that's the type of level that can impact the body negatively if we don't address it, if we don't process it. There is no right or wrong number. These numbers simply let us know how strongly this feeling is impacting our body and our mind. Because a lot of times we like to think that our mind has the final say. Our mind is the most important thing. But in truth, the body and the mind experience things. But the mm. body is more important because the brain can die. You can be brain dead and the body will still keep moving. Mm. But if your body dies, your whole body shuts down. So a lot of times when we go through these traumatic experiences, we want to think our way through it. And that's only one half of the battle. We also need to process what our body is carrying. Mm. And so I say that because now that we know concern, anxiety, worry, and overwhelm, our tens, we're going to move to locate because now we've calculated. Now we're going to locate in your body. Where do you feel concern? And it could be in more than one place. Where do you feel this feeling of concern in your body? I, I think initially it is, I can feel it now. It's mm. in the back the upper part of my neck, like leading into the, the to the bottom of my head. Mm. Um, and in my stomach, almost like a sickness. Like you feel, you feel, nauseous in the moment you're doing great cj these type of descriptions are so helpful what do you feel in your body around that anxiety because i understand concern shows up in the upper part of your neck and it comes and you feel it in your stomach um almost it when i think of that similar feelings um mm -hmm. but also like a like a tightness in your chest right so it's mm -hmm. like it's almost almost like you're forgetting how to breathe because mm -hmm. you're you know uh not necessarily hyperventilating but like a like oh my gosh what am i gonna do next kind of a in your a tightness in your chest mm, like forgetting to breathe yeah mm. And what does worry feel like in your body? Oh, gosh. And this uh, can be more than one place. I think worry is more of a, I think it's a combination again, mm -hmm. but that's a, your brain is running, right? So that's the mm -hmm. worry comes in, the anxiety comes in of like, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? What's the right thing? Am I going to say the wrong thing? Is mm -hmm. Am I going to make the right move in the midst of this? I think that's mm -hmm. where that comes. So does that feel or can you take that feeling and see it anywhere in your body? Is it the entire body? What does worry feel like? You did a great job of telling me what it feels like in your mind. What does it feel like in connection to your body? Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I'm beyond, I don't know that I've paid attention to it before. I want to normalize that. Because yeah. in a space around worry, that almost makes us think that it's limited to the mind. It's my yeah. thoughts. But the truth of the matter is our body is also experiencing worry. And so I also want to normalize taking your time to think about these things. We can come back to that. If mm -hmm. it comes up later on and you see where it is, feel free to share that. If it's something that you take home with you, you know me personally. So mm -hmm. we could always you know, move forward for the watching audience. Sorry, you missed that. Yeah, but hopefully yeah. you're following along. Overwhelmed. Tell me where you feel that in your body. Um, that feels more like a, I notice it probably in my shoulders where it just mm -hmm. feels like you're, you're carrying a weight, you know, like mm -hmm. you're, you're not, you're not standing up straight. You're not feeling confident. You're feeling like, you're literally carrying a weight on your shoulders. And so as we think about where we're feeling these strong feelings in the body, we have the neck, we have the stomach, we have a tightness in the chest, a almost you have to remind yourself to breathe, worry, we're not even sure where it is, but you mentioned it in connection with your thoughts. So out for now, I'll say it's in your head. Mm -hmm. And then overwhelm is again, 
that heaviness on your shoulders. Mm. And as you feel these things, because we're at locate, you locate where on your body you feel the stress. Now we're moving to communicate because everything we're doing right now is designed to bring awareness of how this situation is impacting my body mm. and putting me in control to address it. All of these are tools. One is awareness and the other is active engagement in the moment. So this thing doesn't keep moving forward. Communicate is one of the most important parts because I want to discuss what is the self-talk and maybe even some images that you would bring to mind to take these feelings of a 10 to a nine. We're going to take it in small steps. So what's some of the things you tell yourself to take these feelings of concern, anxiety, worry, and overwhelm from a 10 to a nine? Me personally, I, I almost immediately think um, of who, who do I need to speak with, right? For mm -hmm. me, it's like sharing the feel, mm -hmm. even the feeling of this is how overwhelmed I am. I'm not sure what to do. What are, what's mm -hmm. the next move? Sharing that with someone that I trust, not even necessarily someone that has the answer. That mm -hmm. helps me a lot to just mm -hmm. start thinking about that's part of my pain plan is already having identified those folks. So I know who to go to. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely a research based uh, thing to do because there is a natural endorphin that is released when you're in the presence of someone you know, you have a very strong like, know, and trust factor with. And some of the best scenarios are when you are with someone you can be embraced by because touch is a very powerful thing. Whether it's a hug, whether it's someone holding your hand, whether it's someone putting a shoulder on you, that touch is absolutely very therapeutic. In the situation where you don't have people you can talk to, what are some of the things you can tell yourself in the moment? It is great that you're already thinking about, okay, who can I talk to? Who can I take this to? But let's say that they're not available. What is the self-talk you can use in the moment to take it from a 10 to a nine? I Any think one of these things. Over time, what has happened, I can't remember how I necessarily process it when I began teaching, but mm -hmm. after this happened a number of times, it became a thought of, I got to get it together because there mm -hmm. are, I need to take care of the kids. I need to be mindful of the students. So that mm -hmm. almost helps me snap out of some of that so I can focus on like, what are the needs around me so I can handle, handle the work mm -hmm. that's in front of me. Mm -hmm. This is great because it, it brings us back to some of the language I mentioned with the pain plan. It is great that you're thinking about your students. It is great that you're thinking about how I can reach out to others. I want to add a suggestion to this language for future pain plans and for those that are watching that you also think about that positive language of, I can do this. Hmm. I have been in this situation before, thinking about some of the ways in which you got through that grief, understanding that this is not unfamiliar to me. I know what it is to feel this feeling of concern, anxiety, worry, overwhelm. These feelings are here to let me know that my body's on high alert. I can handle this. Mm. I have worry. I felt worry before and I processed it and I got through it. Worry did not destroy my classroom. Worry did not take me out of my element. I will still be able to teach and guide these students. This feeling is just passing through me and I see it and I acknowledge it. Mm. I have anxiety in my body. I am dealing with a very stressful thing and I have anxiety because I care about myself and the students or whatever things that are giving you anxiety. It's because something about you cares about it. Mm. And I see that and I thank my body for letting me know that this is there. What we're doing as we walk through this self-talk is that we're taking away the fear, the bigness, the overwhelm, and we're acknowledging that our feelings are doing what they're supposed to do. Our feelings are indicators. They let us know where our body is. Feelings should never be drivers that control how we move. 
But when we don't allow ourselves to process it and we have a knee jerk reaction, that's when things can go left very, very quickly. Because if you lead out of concern, if you lead out of anxiety, if you lead out of worry and overwhelm, you are not showing up as your full self. You're absolutely not showing up as your best self because everything is being controlled by your nervous system. And the body is designed to protect itself. And the brain at that level is just thinking about survival. Right? And so as you sit, yeah, I know. As you sit in this, and that's why it's so important to allow yourself to sit in these difficult things and remind yourself, even if you don't believe it, you say it until you do. I can get through this. These feelings are passing through me. I see them and I acknowledge them. And I will let them flow through me. If you need to be visual, imagine a stream. Imagine a wave just passing through you. Mm -hmm. I feel it and then I let it go. And if it comes back, that's fine. I can let it pass through me. This doesn't have to be something that I have this feeling of overwhelm around. I can be overwhelmed, but I'm not going to live in overwhelm. See yourself walking through a stream, not standing in the stream. I think that's better visual language for those of you who are seeing this visually. Each feeling is a stream to walk through. But when we don't process it, we just sit, we stand in overwhelm. We stand in fear. Yeah. And we continue to try and teach and do all the things. And after you have communicated with yourself, then you breathe and exhale. I want to suggest for these type of situations, and we're going to practice this. I want you to breathe in through the, well, let me tell you what I call it. It's five, seven, eight. Five is the number of grace. Seven is the number of completion. And eight is the number of um, new beginnings. And so when you breathe in the nose for five seconds, you're breathing in grace. And then I want you to hold that breath for seven seconds. That's the number of completions. You gather everything that you felt, all of those emotions, gather them up. And then as you exhale for eight seconds, you let them go. So you breathe in that grace for five seconds. Breathe in the grace that you took the time to do the CLCVE exercise that you took the time to be in touch with your body and then hold for seven seconds. Gather everything that is no longer serving you in this moment. All those emotions. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. I'm sure you'll come back again. Eight seconds, release it all. It's time for you to go. Mm. Breathe in a new beginning. And it's great to do that in the moment. Five, seven, eight. And if you can't do that, Simply breathe in deeply through the nose and exhale through the mouth in a deep rhythm. Four seconds, six seconds. Four seconds through the nose, six seconds through the mouth. And if you can't remember that, simply breathe in through the nose, exhale through the mouth. Until you feel yourself start to relax because you're going to release endorphins. You're going to release yeah. the body's natural pressure release systems that help you come back to yourself. What were you going to say? I, I, you know, one of the things I, I am really taking away from this is, is that one that you mentioned when it comes back again, right? This isn't a fix. It's not a mm -hmm. one-off thing. You're not going to do it and be like, all right, I'm good. Like we mm -hmm. can keep going with life. The other thing is, I think, you know, Dr. Keisha, one of the things that, and I had to learn this a very hard way was that there is this innate feeling in teachers to want to fix their students, yes. to save them from those feelings, to save them from those moments, um, to, to want to show up and be able to be something for kids. And I think we often forget that our attention is more important than our advice, right? Yes. Number one, but that also this actually, this literally gives you something to do with students like like when you are dealing with someone who is hyperventilating who yes. is who's breaking down yes. and you know what, what do we always say we always tell kids like breathe just breathe yes. but this is literally something yes. that anyone can do in yes. the moment with a yes. student with a staff member with themselves and that is going to help them 
to calm themselves so that the work can be done. And, and that, that feels so unbelievably empowering to me right now exactly. that I just hope that, you know, like anyone that's watching this at whatever point you're, you're watching this, know that you have tools. There are things, and this yeah. is just, you know, one we're talking about right now. There are things yeah. you can do to help you to show up um, yeah. and, and, and not just feel like a victim in, in yeah. the moment. And this is a research-based tool created by Dr. Howard C. Stevenson, who is one of the strongest academic minds in the area of processing racial stress in the body. He has over 35 years of experience. And this is what he put forward as the most important tool for processing racial stress. And what I love about Lion's story is that they want this message to get out far and wide around CLCBE. They do all sorts of amazing trainings, but this is one of the most important tools. And what I want to share, because when I work with educators and I've taught them this, I have to consistently remind educators that you must put on your own oxygen mask first before you jump into teaching someone else. Gosh. Before you talk to your students, make sure you have CLCBE yourself because what you have not dealt with will come across in the words you say. Do not teach with your hands tied behind your back. Do not teach with your nervous system still in a very high state. Take a second, learn this, do this for yourself, then teach it to others. Do it with others. Do not allow yourself to give advice in the communication part, but be empathetic yeah. and asking and listening for how you can show up and support yes. that student as they are talking themselves from whatever number they're at to the next number underneath yeah. it. Yeah. That That's is the most it. empowering thing you can do. That is the best support you can give them is being willing to walk alongside or sit with them in these difficult emotions until they understand how to move forward. That, that, that I just want to reiterate that because I think that is so important because no one wants to feel harried to get better. Right. No one wants to feel like, all right, come on. We only have the period's going to end. We need to hurry up and do this. And so when you are willing to sit quietly with someone in their hurt, I feel like it's one of the greatest gifts you can ever give someone. You're, you're, you're acknowledging that and saying, this is good. We have all day. Like we, we, I have as much time as you need. Um, and it's not going to take all day, right? You're going to, you're, you'll, but you want to give space to that that process to be able to happen and not to feel like there needs to be a right answer that this should be happening by now or, or any of that stuff. It's, it's having that just presence that anyone can show up that you don't have to save or fix anyone that you can just sit with someone in their hurt is one of the greatest gifts you can give anyone. Yeah, um, I do want to make sure that we, do, do we have, do you want to take a few minutes? There's, I feel like we could go on and on and on about this. For that is, we absolutely can, but I just want to add that that is a fragile gift. So it must be handled delicately because if you do, unfortunately, come across as superficial by rushing or starting this process and ending it abruptly, you can damage your relationship. So yeah. I also just want that to be known because we're talking about a dangerous opportunity when someone is in pain and you're coming forward with the solution. If I extend something as fragile as hope in the midst of my pain, you have to treat it with the utmost care. And, and in that, I mean, just real quick, I think that's, so I'm thinking of teachers, they're in the classroom, they're not sure if like, do I have the moment? I have 32 kids, one student's having a breakdown, um, cause like you said, it's sometimes months and months and months afterwards, this is showing up. What do I do in that? And to that, you know, one of the things we're always talking about with our community is that teaching is a communal activity and mm -hmm. that you have to have other, like part of your pain plan needs to be for students, right? So who are you calling? Who are you texting? Who are you poking your head out the door to, to call upon? Because you can't always be the one that's going to be able to be there for that student. But there needs to be someone that is available. 
This needs to be a part of your school's pain plan as to who can I call upon in a moment where I'm literally in the middle of teaching Shakespeare to 27 kids and one student needs someone and I am not available, right? Or do I even want to have that student have a breakdown in the middle of, of everyone, right? I want to get you to a safe space where you feel like you can explore and express some of those things you're going through and feeling um, with someone that's a trusted individual. So, you know, I, I think that that's, I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. Um, I'm going to pull, look, folks, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, these are not in order. My Typically, my wife is sitting here with me. Um, <laughs> we are so, have uh, our co-pilot. I know. Yeah. So, <laughs> she, so that's me queued up, feel free. I want to speak to what you shared. This is why it's so important for you as educators to learn how to do CLCBE and practice it often until it becomes as natural as breathing for you. So you can process these difficult things in the moment and then be able to get your higher cognitive thinking involved versus overwhelm anxiety and initial reaction. Like all of this is going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm trying to keep it quick, but yeah, like yeah. there's so no, many nuggets. I hear you. No, this is a this story of my life. The story of my life is short question, long answer. Um, so Cecily is asking, how can we safely normalize the possibility of this type of violence within a schoolhouse while also maintaining an atmosphere of safety, belongingness, and well-being? I know what I would say to that, but I'm really curious what your answer to this would be. I would say continue to have that pain plan. And I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version so I can you know, make sure I can sleep at night because I gave you all five. So we spent a lot of time around what will I say uh, to others and what will I say to myself because that's the most important thing. That's your mindset and that's how you communicate what you need to others. Secondly, who will I talk to? Like CJ pointed out, who are the people that I know I can trust in this moment of my vulnerability? And what is, and that's where I also share the hot, uh, the website with all of the resources. Um, so you have a more in-depth list in terms of who will I talk to? There is a 24-7 hotline that connects you with the crisis, with a counselor around these type of mental health issues that are particularly connected to uh, gun violence. And so I'll share that with you. What you want to make sure is as you're talking, as you're thinking about who I will talk to, you don't want to allow your pain to cause you to have a conversation with someone you wouldn't usually talk to. Mm. You don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're not applying relational intelligence because that's why you're having this pain plan right now. Sometimes the feeling can be so overwhelming that you're like, I just got to talk to somebody and you may talk to somebody you know isn't the best option. In those moments, I'm going to advise you to journal or use your phone, use the voice memo and talk to your phone until you can get into a space where you can talk to somebody you trust. That's why you need that pain plan so you don't make that, you know, knee jerk reaction. And then think about how you will physically move your body. What can I do to physically move my body? This is how we bring the body into it. And it needs to have a rhythm. Because when the body is moving in a, something with a rhythm, it helps it release. Mm. Walking is great. Dancing, anything that gets your body moving is something you want to begin to think about. What can that look like? And what will I use to center myself and reestablish peace? If you're from a faith-based mindset, my hoodie already tells you what to do. If you look at this from a different perspective, use some form of meditation that you know grounds you. And if you don't see any of that as coming to a higher power as something that's appealing to you, I want you to pull whatever resources you have centered within yourself to bring yourself back to your baseline of normalcy. Whatever that looks like. If you bring in things like journaling, if you bring in things like deep breathing, whether you're looking at a higher power or you're just simply getting yourself back into stillness, use that time. And then lastly, understand what will you believe about your future? Will you believe that this situation is going to overwhelm you and you'll never get over it? Or do you believe that things will get better? Can you, ha <coughs> Excuse me. Can you maintain a positive outlook? And having that pain plan 
can keep you from going too far down the level of disassociation or numbness or hopelessness. Because at the end of the day, what you say impacts how you move forward. Yeah, that's so piggybacking off something you said earlier on, it's this idea of, um, I think as a teacher, I'm, it, it made me think of, we gravitate towards the things that with which we are the most familiar with, right? So mm-hmm. when I've noticed, and, and I think, you know, Cecily, one of the things I would communicate with my students is that should something happen, um, letting, if you feel comfortable, letting kids know that you are a safe place to have this conversation. We, I remember once, uh, there was a young man that was killed at our school, Bill. Uh, Bill was shot uh, on Easter Sunday, died mm-hmm. several days later uh, from that gun wound. And students came back from Easter break and were j- broken. The school had hired uh, like two counselors to come in and talk to the kids. They put them in a, in a certain classroom mm-hmm. and they could not figure out why the kids wouldn't go in and talk to them. But all, all of our rooms, like all the teachers that were always having like real conversations with students inundated, you couldn't teach. You'd have 50 students in your, in your classroom that just, even if they didn't talk, they just wanted to be around you. And so it is remembering that sometimes bringing in strangers is not going to be the answer. The students want you. They want to go to someone they know and trust that no, no one trust factor is already there. That's who they're going to gravitate towards. So don't, do not be you know, surprised. And the, gang, this could be for anything. This is if there was gun violence, if someone's parents split up, if someone was put into foster care, you know, if you're dealing with young children, I mean, not just young children are going to deal with this, but like if someone's dog dies, I mean, there's, there's people's stuff is their stuff. And so they're going to gravitate towards folks that they are familiar with. Um, the next question that I see on here is actually, is from Cecily again, because I do not have the ability to multitask. This is not a gift that I have in my life. So um, the trauma does not end with the experience. Few. Those are some practical and tactical, or what are some practical and tactical ways that this issue can be addressed within a building that doesn't currently use trauma-informed practices. Mm-hmm. What, what I am and what I am suggesting is that in this situation, we're going to apply the Gandhi approach in the sense of you be the change you want to see. Because what I just taught you around CLCBE is a trauma-informed practice that you can bring into the space. But outside of the building, um, in terms of what we can all rally around, is finding helpful language to help students not fall into the trap of watching graphic videos of people they know or people that look like them or people in their demographic being murdered. Because that is a way to compound trauma in a way that has very long lasting effects, particularly when something has just happened. So having language that guides students in, okay, this has happened. And right now we're at ground zero. What are ways you can be informed by still protecting your self-care, by still protecting your mental health? What if we read the stories about it? What if we look at, you know, the social media feeds that you trust, but we agree not to look at videos for the first 24 hours? Because right now the story is still being formed. Like I'm giving you a very loose example, but what I'm trying to make clear is that we want to minimize the impact of people looking at videos that are just designed to traumatize them. Yeah. Because the research is still studying the phenomenon of what this does. But we do know that you can have what CJ has already called secondary trauma. That can occur through these videos, particularly with the fact that no one can stop you from watching it over and over and over again or talking about it or putting your what the video can do is basically spin you out of spin you outside of your pain plan. Because it can be so shocking that you want to talk about it and you find yourself talking to people who are not the best situation because you're just talking about this stuff online. And you may come across someone who agitates. There's a lot of conflict waiting for you online. That's that's building trauma on top of trauma 
and maybe sprinkling in some shame, depending on how you react. Yes, I think I'm thinking of two quick things. One, real practical for teachers. And, and I mean, I, one is addressing your administration, right? It's having the conversation and saying, look, we, we need to do something about this. Now, I've worked for different administrators. Some of them are willing to have that conversation. Some of them go, that's a little too, it's, it's too much. They're not going to have that conversation, right? They're not, they, are not, uh, they are not equipped to have that conversation. Yeah. In those moments, look, you know, like there's there's the meeting that happens at, at school. We, we, we There's always like a meeting about anything. And then there's the meeting that happens after the meeting. Right. Oh. So that's what I'm always looking for is who are the people that I'm in community with that something happened. And now oh. we're going to go. All right. Listen, what are we going to do? Like, what are we going to do? And that can be something that we're just agreeing so I might agree with someone that I work with that, look, if that student is having a particularly difficult day or, um, you know, we'll, we'll have conversations like, all right, so when Bill was, was shot, he had a lot of friends. We had to identify who those friends were, who we knew had a strong home presence, whose like mom was going to take them to therapy and whose dad was going to be able to talk to them about it. And then those students that might retaliate, those students that might get want to go get caught up in the streets. So we need to make sure that we're just touching base. And then everyone is sort of, um, we, we are, we're coming up with that plan. I think the other thing in talking to kids about some of this stuff is, you know, Mr. Rogers uh, shared this idea uh, in a book that he wrote years ago, where we're, when we're watching the news, when we're watching social media, when this stuff just keeps coming up and you're seeing it again and again and again and again, are we looking for the helpers? Because if you look behind what you're focusing on, what you're being made to focus on sometimes, mm -hmm. it's looking for the not just the fire, but who's yeah. running into the fire to save yeah. folks. Who's Great. helping someone outside the ambulance? Yeah. And yeah. I think when that happens, it takes this from being the world is so horrible to but who showed up? And yeah. so sometimes we have to really look deep for that. But that, I think, allows students to focus on something other than just the horrific incident. It's mm -hmm. focusing on the love, the hope, um, mm -hmm. other humans that are showing up to care and mm -hmm. to give folks in those moments, too. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm seeing if there's like one more question we can kind of hit, hit real quick, but uh, I'm really just looking for question marks. So uh -huh. if you're not you're not using your grammar everyone you know the english teacher <laughs> can't, find, can't find a question um <laughs> let me say this I, and and maybe we could uh if you do have a question uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna say this that if because we're running out of time dr keisha if it's all right with you can we put yeah. some of your contact information um i'm thinking your instagram uh, might be a good place to kind of find that so folks can DM you and I will put your tag under this. So if there is a follow-up question, you can do that. Um, or, and for me, um, it is Sunday Night Teacher Talk is there, or you can just hit us up right at realrapwithreynolds.com. But would, would, do you think that's a fair? Yeah, I think people are very welcome to follow me on Instagram at uh, Dr. Keisha Cares. And I know you'll share all that information. So don't mm -hmm. worry, I'm not going to um, put all the details out there. But one thing I do within my uh, social media, my reels, is that I offer mindset coaching tips. But as a professional, a global education consultant and a mindset coach, I'm very passionate about helping school districts, individuals, and classrooms really think through these things. So there are more than, there are several ways that we can do this, but making sure that people understand how to process these things in their body is where my passion lies. And it has been an honor to spend this time supporting the educators in your audience because it is far too, too long of a wait for us to be having this conversation. And I, I don't accept the fact that people don't have these tools. So I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to come on your page, come on your channel and share that very important tool of CLCBE. Because if you use that one tool, if you do nothing else with what we shared, but if you learn CLCBE 
it will be transformational in how you go through life, life, yep. because it applies. I'm telling you what I know. I use it. Just yep. used it the other night. That Look, I, I think I love that you said that you just that not not having this is not an option. I, I think for no. anyone that um, that is concerned about that, that you're like, but my school doesn't have this, but we don't handle it. Look, people treat you the way you teach them to treat you. And so I think that this is something that when you're going in and, and I, I'll give this one quick tip for how I get, a, I get, I've gotten way, a way better response than maybe I would have otherwise. When I go into administrative uh, offices, when I go into board meetings, when I'm going into the parent teacher conferences or, or like anywhere that I, I want something, if you make it about students, right? It's not something that I want, even though that might be something that benefits me. We need to do something for kids. And so, and th then I use, th this is a little trickier. This is a little, maybe, uh, uh, I don't know if this is too much for folks, but if, if the answer is no, right? So we know how sometimes uh, when we go to leadership, there's a roundabout sort of kind of way that you're going to uh -huh. say no. Uh -huh. I always go with this. So are we refusing to get the help for the students? That's what we're saying right now. And that language, that like of, of switching it to, are, is that what we're saying? We're refusing to do this for students and not coming at it from necessarily a manipulative way, but out of, you're almost asking with curiosity. Is that what we, are we are we saying we're refusing to do this for students? That will sometimes get folks to go, oh, wait, no, 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 no. Because it's that important. Because what yeah. we're trying to do here at schools is help students to be successful, to find a, to live a life that they dream of living. And how can we not do that? How can we teach if we're not addressing these sort of things first? So, um, look, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I love that we have connected over the last I don't even know. It hasn't even been that long, but it just really feels like sometimes you meet folks that you yeah. immediately identify with and you're like, oh, like, like we might as well have been friends for 20 years already. You know what I mean? So I, just, back. I love this whole researcher educator vibe. Like you have the classroom in classroom experience. I come from the research based policy level. Like this was a good blend. I'm inviting myself back. I want to come. <laughs> I'm inviting myself back. I'm, I'm going, guys, you're going to see me more often. I love it. I'm I love it. checking in to make sure you guys are okay and you're processing this stuff in your body because we need you. Our kids need you. Our society needs you. Amen. Look, I'm going to let everyone go. Don't, don't you jump off yet, but I'm going to let everyone go. Um, <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for, for showing up. If you have any further questions, you can leave them in the comments, or please, you can reach out to Dr. Keisha through her Instagram, at Dr. Keisha Cares, or myself through at Real Rap with Reynolds, or just go to realrapwithreynolds.com, and, and I'll get it there. But thank you so much. Peace, everybody.